Eternal Father, what a privilege it is knowing that at the foot of the cross everyone may come kneeling, praising, exalting your high and holy name, humbly bowing at your footstool, acknowledging you as our maker and our king. And so, Father, we consider this privilege to be so great that it humbles us. It causes us to think, Father, that you must love us so because we are so sinful and you're holy. Thank you, Lord, for considering that we really needed someone to save us despite ourselves. And so tonight we present this waiting congregation, those who are listening on the World Wide Web, inclusive of those who are in this church this evening, we say to God be the glory, great things you have done. Open our minds, open our understanding, open our wills tonight to submit to the will of God because it is only as we do this that we will find peace and sweet rest. At the end of our service tonight, we ask, Lord, that those among us who have not yet made it right with you will determine by your grace to yield to the bidding of the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ, because we pray in his blessed name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Not sure. Good evening, everyone. That's a little chinch a bit better. I know that we like, to, we like to give the evangelists some trouble in the night. And so that is why we, we do not say the good evening as vibrantly as we would like. So I say again, good evening everyone. Good evening. It is good for us to be in the house of God. And we never enter his courts without a blessing. The God who we serve knew from eternity past who would be present here tonight. Who would be listening on the World Wide Web. And who among us will be blessed by this message. And so I want to welcome our online audience to the Way of the Cross Gospel Campaign. May the Lord bless you wherever you are. Please share your comments and questions in our response forms on our website or on our Facebook event page. If you are in the Kingston and St. Andrew region, come and join us at the Andrews Memorial St. Adventist Church, 29 Hope Road. Kingston. As a matter of fact, we will meet on Sabbath morning at 11, where we will have our final presentation in the series, I am a Seventh-day Adventist because. If you have missed any message, please do not miss this one. It will ex explain to us why it is that who we are, what we are, and the objective of being a Seventh-day Adventist, what it is that God has in store for us. Last night we were taken to heavenly places. I'd like to thank our, I would like to thank our, 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 our team that did our meditation song. The fact is that every evening we have been favored with lovely singing. Do you agree, church? Yes. Every evening and every Sabbath we have had good singing. Lord has blessed his people with many gifts. Gifts which ought to be used to bring honor and glory to his name. And if there's one thing that I... When I was younger, I thought I could sing because I was on my school choir and in my Sunday school choir and I was in my, in my little, little groups, wherever I was, I would sing. And lo and behold, I got married and I, st I tried to sing for the one I love and she said, what you can't sing? <laughs> And that was the end of my singing career. <laughs> but if it is one thing I'm looking forward to doing when I get to heaven, is to get the gift of song. What do you say? God is good. And then when I sing, I would, I would like her to tell me that I can't sing. <laughs> we were taking to heavenly places last night. Oh, the eternal home of the saved. This evening we'll be looking at the contrast to the eternal home of the saved. This is a message which I would like us to pay close attention to because in the wisdom of God, he has told us that there's a heaven to win and a hell to shun. There's a thing called salvation and there's a thing called damnation. So the, the message tonight is entitled, What in hell do you want? When I was growing up, 
I heard this expression sometimes when we, when we cause consternation to the hearts of our parents. They may have been trying to get us to say or do things a certain way. And we weren't cooperative. And I've heard it expressed in the community that I lived. And so, when the time came to choose a topic, and I was thinking about it, this one came to mind. What in hell do you want? What do you want? What are you looking for? As we consider, there are many people who tell us, that the devil is in charge of hell. There are some people who think the devil is someone with, 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 who has a, a, has a tail and horns and, and maybe has a pitchfork. That's how people describe the devil when I was growing up. And they always told us that the, the pitchfork would be used to throw us into hell. Because the devil is in charge. And we always felt that the devil was this great and powerful person. But I want to tell us something tonight. The devil is not in charge of hell. The devil is not in charge of hell. The devil is going to be a part of hell. And so we hear people make statements like this. Describing a stove. The stove is as hot as hell. I've heard this one said, it is as cold as hell. If hell is going to be fire, how can it be cold? Then we hear another expression. The dog is as mean as hell. People really do not understand what hell is and what it is that hell will be like. And so in our own way of expression, expressions and making points, we use some of these expressions sometimes to depict hell and what our concept of hell is. But hell is something to be avoided. It is a place to be avoided. There will be no touch me in hell. There will be no put it here in hell. And I am going to, there is not, come brother Baron, there is no high fives in hell. None. No touch me. No put it here. No high five in hell. It is a place of torment. It is a place, it will be, not is, it will be a place of pain, of torment, of utter devastation to the human being. This is a picture of a young man in New Delhi. He is a Tibetan, and you know there's a problem between the Dalai Lama and the Chinese. So the Chinese president was coming to visit some years ago. India and in New Delhi this young man decided as an act of protest that he set himself ablaze he set himself ablaze in protest hell is to be avoided because hell is not going to be easy hell is not going to be a place that we will enjoy instead you will have anyone who ends up in hell we know that fourth degree burns are fatal. But in hell you may have 400 degree burns. It will be painful. All layers of skin are gone with a fourth degree burn. Permanent tissue damage. And also fat, muscle, bone, everything gone. If any of us can remember the days when we used to use home sweet home lamps and our parents would say to us do not play with the fire how many of us used to play with the fire how many of us were burned brother gray i say you are not a jamaican electric light <laughs> we were burnt and it felt good didn't it no it was painful. Anyone who, is, who gets beyond a, a fourth degree burn and beyond, if that is possible, will have a painful death. And we are not being morbid tonight. What we are trying to put in context is what it is that is the alternative to heaven. There will be mental agony in hell. Pain, because mental agony brings pain as well. One will be eternal, there will be eternal separation from God and from our loved ones. And if 
Our loved one should die and we feel that pain. Can you imagine being separated from God and you knew before the separation that you will be separated? That is going to be painful. Mental agony. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to our church repentance. It is repentance and my acknowledging my sins that brings me to a place where I can be reconciled with God. God has made all the provisions for that. But some people will tell us, God is too good. God is too kind. God is too loving. God is too forgiving to burn anyone in hell. I have heard expressions like those. God is so loving and kind and caring and, and forbearing and patient and long-suffering. He will never burn anyone in hell. But the devil wants us to believe all kinds of nonsense regarding the concept of hell so that we will not be spurred into action. A choice not to be there. But when we search the scriptures, Ezekiel, Exodus chapter 34 verse 7 says, Talking about the God who is merciful and gracious and long-suffering. And the Bible describes him this way. Keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Read for me now church. And that will by no means clear the guilty. He will never clear the guilty. And this is why I love my God. Because when you read the Bible. God did not write the Bible in a way. Or cause people to write it under inspiration. Just writing all the good things that people did. God is not a cover up God. So the Abraham who is described as the man who was righteous. The Bible tells us of the things that Abraham did wrong. So my God is not going to cover up anything. He will not clear the guilty. But he will forgive the guilty. He can't clear me. He can't say that I'm not guilty knowing that I'm guilty. So the Bible says that he has made every single provision to save me from sin. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 21 says, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work. And then the Bible uses an expression which we need to analyze pretty well. It says, His strange work. And bring to pass his act. His strange act. God's work is strange. And his act is strange. When considered, when considered his, uh, in the context of his character. A God of love. A God of care. A God who will always say that I am not going to leave you nor forsake you. So what it is that would allow God not to be loving and caring as we consider him. God doesn't want us to take advantage of his love or his caring nature or his forgiving nature. God is saying that there's going to be a line. There's a line that people will cross that will allow God to execute judgment on the guilty. And so Psalm chapter 9 verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. It is going to be the reality. There is no way, there is no way to pretend as if this will not be so. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Why? Why is this so? Isaiah 65 verse 12 says, Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear. Read this now for me, church. But did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. So what we are seeing is that men and women, boys and girls, are doing the opposite of what God wants or delights in. And so because God made us with the freedom of choice, he has to honor my choice. Whether it is my choice that will cause him to save me, or my choice which will cause me to be lost. He cannot change it. The only change he can make is when I say, Lord, please forgive me. Lead me into paths of righteousness. And so the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. 
That is what God could have done. He wanted someone as a substitute so that I would not have to die eternally. So he made Jesus to be sin. Notice the Bible didn't say he made Jesus a sinner. Jesus never sinned. And that is why he could pay the price for me and you who knew no sin. He's described in Revelation 13 verse 8 as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God made every provision to save you and me. 1 Peter 1.18 For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. And that is why when the Bible talks about God doing his strange work or his strange act, we know the expression pretty well. It says there's a thin line between love and hate. The God who loves us so much and did everything to save me. A time is going to come when because of my choices and my actions, he will have to do what I am justly, justly, justly going to correct, collect. I'm sorry. So the Bible says, Jesus is as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He did everything to save you and I. Jesus Christ suffered a death sentence so that you and I may have life and have life more abundantly. And I'm going to repeat that. Jesus Christ faced a death sentence so that you and I may have life and have life more abundantly. So tonight, I would like you to read this statement with me please. The significance of Jesus' death cannot be treated as a light thing. It may seem as if it is not such a great thing. Just this past few days, there was an impending hurricane. And preparations were made. And because the hurricane didn't come, some people who really didn't, weren't really thinking, started to complain. I've spent so much money. I've lost time at work. I have, I have, I have. And there was no hurricane. Let us kill the people who told us there was a hurricane. That is essentially what they were saying. But look at what has happened to Haiti. As a matter of fact, I want you to think, to this morning we're on our way to work and there was a section of the Constant Spring Road which sank. And the chaos that that one little hole has caused. This evening, how many of us were in the traffic jam? One little hole on Canton Spring Road and the whole place turned downside up. And we are here thinking that the death of Jesus is just another, another event. It is, it is that God has done something for us that is beyond our understanding. But the value of it is eternal. You and I, if you are sitting in this church this evening and you have never come, Brother Baron, if you and I, who is going to sing for me? This is a song that I like us to do, Brother Murray, put, put your notice on. Huh? Right. Where is my praise team? No praise team, come, Brother Aze. You are in the choir. You must can sing. I've heard you sing. I've heard you sing um, solo. So you must can sing. Come, Brother Aze. Come and help us sing this song. This song is on the screen. There's one who was willing to die on the cross. You know it, Ozzy? You know it by heart too. You know it enough to read it. It is in the old hymnal. Please let us stand as we sing the song because there was one who was willing to die on the cross. Ready? There was one who was willing to, to die, die in my stead. That a soul so unworthy might live And the path to the cross He was willing to tread All the sins of my life to forgive they are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to live. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went. 
to the cross, but he carried my sins with him there. I will cling to my Savior and never depart. I will joyfully journey each day with a song on my lips and a song in my heart that my sins have been taken away. To the cross, they are near to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear with what anguish and loss. Jesus went to the cross. But he carried my sins with him there. Let us read the verse, these words together again. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross. But he carried my sins with him there. What do you say this evening? Please be seated. That is why you cannot consider the significance of Jesus' death as minor. Anyone in the church this evening who has never, never thought of giving your heart to Jesus, it is something that you must consider. Maybe you just came tonight for the first time, hearing the first message. Salvation is available even tonight by your choice. The Bible said to us, use the foolishness of preaching to save people and so as we look at the fact tonight that jesus died for me and died for you ezekiel 33 11 says say unto them as i live saith the lord god i have no pleasure in the death of the wicked rather but that the wicked turn from his way unto what church live turn ye turn ye from your evil ways for why will you die? I have died already for you. I have gone to the cross for you. I have done everything necessary and possible to save you. So why is it that you want to be lost? That is a question that you and I have to face. Satan wants you to, and me, to disobey God and sin. And reject forgiveness, salvation, and be lost. This is his plan. He wants every single person in this world to be lost like himself. There is an expression, misery loves company. He knows that he will never go back to heaven. So he tries to make it appear as if heaven is not going to be a good place. He wants everyone lost. He wants us to disobey God and sin and to reject salvation and be lost. Satan uses all manner of tools. He, he uses gambling. He uses drugs. He uses sports. He uses entertainment. He uses work. Work. I remember when I used to work seven days per week. Every day. And I used to take home work in the night. And when I accepted the Advent message. And I heard that there is a thing called the Sabbath that is to be kept. And when I look back on how I was overworking, you probably wouldn't know me. Work is a good thing, but there's an over-intoxication with work. Education can also separate us from God. I'm pursuing my various levels of tertiary and postgraduate and everything. And so everything seems so important as they are. We're on a treadmill the devil is using good things as well as bad things to keep us focused on what does not really matter in comparison to the value of salvation. He uses sex. He uses the fact that people say there is no hell to shun. 
I remember there was a man who was trying to get me to be a member of his lodge. And he said to me, jump. There is no heaven and there is no hell. What you live down here is your heaven or your hell. I said, you're sick of your head. <laughs> Virgin and friends, he wants us to think that there is no hell. Because he knows that there is going to be a hell. Malachi 4 verse 1 says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yea, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, and they will be, it will leave them neither root nor branch. Read that church. They will be ashes. Ashes. Why should anyone choose to be ashes when the person can choose and have life and have life more abundantly? Why would anyone choose to the decisions that will cause them to burn in hell? And so the question is asked, will hell, will hell burn forever? When I, was a, when I used to attend the Sunday church, there was something that caused me a whole lot of mental pain. When the, I was taught that hell is going to burn and we're going to burn in heaven forever. And, and I said, what kind of God is that? Will hell burn forever? The Bible tells us in, in Jude verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them have been taken, given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Is this happening in the world today? Sexual immorality and going after strange flesh? Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for that. And God is a balanced God, a God of justice. He could not have destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for that and allow us to continue living the way we are. There must be an end. And sooner than most people think. The Bible tells us as we continue, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The fire is not burning eternally. The fire, the effect of the fire has eternal consequence. So the Bible continues. As we look at the story of Lot and his wife. The angels tried to get Lot, his two, all his children and their in-laws out of Sodom. But the night when those angels were there trying to tell them, listen, you need to do this. Lot must have gone out to warn his family. But they weren't paying him any mind because there's no earthquake, no hurricane coming. You are just an angel of doom. You are just telling me a hurricane is coming. But I know no hurricane coming. You're telling me that there are seismic readings that tell me that's going to be an earthquake. I don't know earthquake. Joe, Lot... You, you, you go back home. We are enjoying ourselves here in Sodom. So you leave us alone. And the next morning, Lot didn't want to leave either. So the angels had to put Lot, his two daughters, and his wife outside of Sodom and say, run to the hills. Mrs. Lot looked back and became a pillar of salt. She didn't believe what God said. And the same thing is happening in the world today. The Advent Church is saying, look up your salvation, joy at night. The Advent Church is saying, Jesus is coming soon. But people are not listening. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Condemn them to destruction. Making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. The fire in Sodom and Gomorrah was put out. But Sodom and Gomorrah are burnt up once and for all. They were reduced to ashes. So it is not the fire that is going to be continuously burning. The effects of the fire will be eternal. We will not be tormented in any hell forever. When will this happen? So we are going to go as fast as we can. Matthew 24, 27 the Bible says. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the coming of Jesus. There's a sequence of events that we need to look to. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Jesus comes back. And then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. Because people who should have been making their call and election sure. Were taken up with sports and entertainment and education and this and that. And the devil knows what. All things must be prioritized. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you need will be added. But we want to get all the things first and then come to Jesus last. So the devil is causing me to procrastinate. And we all know pro procrastination is a thief of time. 
The Bible says, And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Brethren and friends, will there be a secret rapture? The devil comes with this anti. For every good teaching the Lord has, the devil has a counterfeit. So I said, don't worry yourself. There is going to be a secret rapture. All the problems that this preacher is talking about, you are not going to go through that problem because all God's people will be raptured away. Jesus doesn't teach that. Matthew 24 verse 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating. Anything wrong with eating? No. But the only thing wrong with eating is eating the wrong food. The lobster and the, <laughs> and the spear ribs. Something is wrong with eating the turbot. Nothing wrong with eating but what we eat. Something is wrong with filling up ourselves with Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because it is causing all kinds of sickness and other things in the fast food. And drinking. And nothing wrong with drinking coconut water. Nothing wrong with drinking what? Fruit juice. And good pure water. But something is wrong with drinking waters. <laughs> Virgin and friends, marrying and giving in marriage. Is anything wrong with marriage? No. The Bible says marriage is all honorable and the bed on the file. But some people are marrying five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Some people have multiple wives. And the Bible says giving in marriage. Nothing is wrong with that. But the Bible says these things that were important, they were marrying, giving in marriage. They were doing some of them were doing the right things. And then the Bible says. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and they didn't even realize the significance of Noah going into the ark. Everything that seemed so important, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, something went wrong. The Bible come on in. The Bible says, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Yet, Noah had been preaching for over a hundred years. Had been preaching for three and a half weeks. I'm glad that many souls have given their hearts to the Lord. But there are many more who should. Because Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And we want to fill up God's kingdom. Church in that say David. We want to fill up God's kingdom. We need to take action to fill up God's kingdom. And so the Bible says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is coming and people are not perturbed. They are not concerned. They are not even thinking about Jesus coming because they have been lulled into a false sense of not security, insecurity. Matthew 24, 40 and 41 says, Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. So who were taken in the flood? Look at it. No one his family were taken in the flood. Who were left? The dead. God preserved no one his family. He took them to a place of safety. Those who were left were dead. They were drowned. Drowned outside the ark. When Noah had been making preparation for them. At the second advent when Jesus returns. Who will be taken? Who will be left? Remember Noah's day? The people who were left are the people who died outside the ark. God is going to take his people to heaven. And so when people tell us that there's going to be a secret rapture. There is going to be no secret rapture. They tell us that there's going to be a seven year tribulation at the end of time. Nothing like that. The Bible doesn't teach that. But Matthew 24 verse 28 says, For wheresoever the carcasses, there will be, there will the eagles be gathered together. Those who are left are dead. And so eagles and junkro will have a feast. And so when Jesus comes back, there are really two classes of people. We're going to divide each class into two, making it four. The wicked living, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.8. 
the wicked dead, according to Revelation 20, verse 5. They are going to be the righteous living, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18, and the righteous dead. Those people who are righteous and dead are going to be resurrected. Let's look at what the Bible tells us about them. The Bible says in, in John 5, verses 28 and 29, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Two separate resurrections. One for the man who is, has salvation, who has chosen salvation, and one for the one who, is resur who, 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 who has chosen condemnation. Soon come. The two resurrections are separated by 1,000 years. The first resurrection of life is when Jesus burst the eastern skies and come back. Then, 1,000 years after, there is a resurrection of the, damn, of the damned. The resurrection of damnation. I want, I, I, when I ask this question, I'm not being frivolous nor am I being facetious. Anyone who wants to be in the resurrection of condemnation, raise your hand. Now let me see if I'm not seeing well. Let me put down. I should, I should get my glasses. Anyone in here want to be in the resurrection of condemnation? No. But unless we choose Jesus, that's where we will end up. And Jesus doesn't want us to choose him three years from now because you do not know if you will be alive three seconds from now. He says today, this moment, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He says now, now, do it. Not tomorrow because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is the state of the earth during the 1,000 years between the two resurrections? The Bible says, Jeremiah 25 verse 33, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. From China to Australia to India to Indonesia to Papua New Guinea. If you want to look at South Korea, North Korea, if you want to look anywhere you look, the Caribbean, anywhere. Every single hemisphere, every single nation across the earth. The Bible says the dead, the slain of the Lord will be there from one end of the earth to the other. But God said he didn't want to do this. He said, I want to save you from your sins. I have, called, I, 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 I have allowed my son to die, so you will not have to die. But people would have chosen death rather than life. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. God's precious people, who the Bible says in the beginning, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. There was a communion between the human race and God. There's a love relationship between God and his people. And yet, and yet, the Bible says in the final analysis, the people who die at Jesus' second advent, they will not be lamented. They will not be gathered. They will not be buried. Why? Because God's people are in heaven. No one will be alive, save and except Satan and his angels. And they are not going to bury anybody. They are not going to say any prayers over. They are glad so many people are dead. Solemn message in a church. And I want you to look at this now. When this happens. And all these dead people are on the ground. The Bible says in Revelation nineteen seventeen, And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice. Listen to what he said. Saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Junkrow, eagle, falcon, all these birds are going to come. Remember the people are, are on the earth from one corner of the earth to the other. And these birds are going to come. The Bible continues saying to the foes that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men. The Bible says the flesh of horses, of them who sat on them, 
and the flesh of all men, both bond and free, small and great. So all who love to eat chicken and eat other kinds of birds, the last last is going to be on the, the human race because they are going to eat humans. Come on, the last chicken supper on earth. It is, it is the birds that will be eating man. This is what the Bible says. We believe that we are cooking these tasty meals. But the last laugh is going to be with the birds. They are going to eat human beings. The Bible says to us, this, we missed out this verse, is verse 21 of Revelation 19. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Some of things might sound new or different because you may not have read them in the Bible. Maybe you read them but you didn't put one and one together. People are going into a certain direction. The earth will be a desolate, destroyed place. If you look on, if you look on your TV screens, when Katrina passed through America, and you saw the devastation, and you look on your TV screens this evening and saw what Haiti looked like, you ain't seen anything yet. And we are not being morbid. We are just preaching what the Lord says. Because God wants to show us. The Bible says. Jeremiah 4 verse 23. I beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void. And the heavens and there was, they had no light. It will be total devastation. Total devastation. Jeremiah 4, 24, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. There will be a constant earthquake during the 1,000 years. The Bible tells us something else. Read with me, church, verse 25 of Jeremiah 4. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled, because having eaten all the men, the men, women, boys, and girls, they now run out of food after a while. And so they are dead too. It's a burden and friends. Only people will be here. Lucifer. And his angels. The Bible says. That they will be chained. They are chained by circumstances. They have no one to tempt. Plus. Having caused the devastation of this world. God said to them, you can't even leave planet earth. Don't even try to fly or go anywhere. Stay right here and see what you have caused. Because your time is coming. Long run, short catch. The Bible says, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord. And by his fierce anger. Earthquake. Tornadoes. All kinds of natural disasters associated with Jesus is coming. And all the cities there were broken down at the presence of the Lord. Every city. Kingston gone. Montego Bay gone. Los Angeles gone. New Delhi gone. Beijing gone. Anai gone. Everything mash up. And the song that they used to sing in the 60s. Its song says, everything crash. Look at all, oh, everything crash. You remember that song? Sometimes just a word, a line from these songs can just bring something spiritual. Everything crash. God is the only one who runs things properly. The devil run down things. The God wants us to know that there is going to be a time when all this will be the reality. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. During that time, we who are saved, but you're not saying amen. During that time, we who are saved. But hold on, you know, you don't intend to be saved. I don't understand you. During that time, I know you're contemplating, but this is something for you to say amen about. During that time, those of us who are saved are in heaven with God. Amen. That is why I come to church. That is why I serve my God. Because I know that he's going to come back the third time with us 
in this beautiful city. We looked at that last night. The Bible tells us that when he comes back the third time, the Bible says in Revelation 20 verse 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Not only that, all those who are the wicked dead are going to be resurrected. So those who died with one foot, come up with one foot. Those who went down with cancer, come up with cancer. Anywhere they went down is so they come up back. Blind people, still blind. They run. The Bible then tells us something. The city is sitting there on the Mount of Olives which now has become a plain. And Jesus is seen above the city. We who are saved are inside the city. Jesus is above the city. The Bible says Revelation 20, 11, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. I wanted church to think of the mighty Jesus sitting on his throne above the new Jerusalem. And all those who are lost. Myriads of people who are lost. There is this great white throne. And so Jesus is now going to show these people things that they needed to remember. And how it is that he tried to save them. Turn that please, Mumili. Verse 12 of Revelation 20 says, And I saw the dead small and great stand before God. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The Bible continues. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books. What church? According to their works. But I want you to think of the solemn statement found in Matthew. The Bible says in Matthew 7 verse 21. Talking about church people now. The Bible says. Not everyone that saith unto me Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. You and I can be in the church and be lost. And people who are in the world can choose salvation and be saved. And so these people who belong to the Lord, listen to what they say. The Bible says, not everyone, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So when we give our lives to Jesus, we need to live according to the word of God. Those who did not give their lives to Jesus are going to come next. The Bible says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils? Mighty acts it appeared that they were doing for the Lord. Lots of these people who are out there will tell you, But wasn't I so faithful in Kiwanis? You know how many people I helped when I was in the Lions Club? Our Optimist Club. Do you remember all those 5K that we organized? And we put the money in Good Samaritan Inn. And in all these foundations. Lord, you, can, you really you don't remember what I did for you. For the poor. Lots of these organizations that are out there. We focus a lot on doing works which are good in the sight of men. But they are falling short in the eyes of God. Salvation is not by works. Salvation is by faith and through grace. So all these people that are going to say, Oh, how is it, Lord, that I am not saved? But God has given each of us a master organ in our heads called our brain. Every single thing that you have done, you have said the motive and reason why you did it. Every decision that you have made, Everything that you have ever experienced in your lives have been registered in your brain. When I did biology a long time, the teacher said, Jump, there is nothing that you have ever done, said, heard or seen that you really forget. It's just that you are unable to recall it. But something happens 10 years after and trigger the memory. Am I speaking the true church? Yes. There are things that I have forgotten. And I'm driving past a place and say something. And I say, hold on. 20 years ago, so and so happened. Everything is in this brain. And so when all these people come to Jesus and say, how it is that I'm lost. All God has to do is touch the stop button. Press the rewind button. 
press play. And every scene from your life, from the time you had sense to understand, start to come across your mind. Those who are lost, we're talking about. Every single decision, the places we went, the reasons we went there, the things we did and said, the times when the Bible workers came to your door and knocked on your door. And when you saw him at the gate, you run through the back gate. The tracks that were given to you, the times you came to the way of the cross crusade. The time when you were invited down to Kingston Parish Church. The times when you went to all these religious places. And you heard the sermon. And you heard somebody say, Jesus died for you. You heard the sermon said, Jesus is coming again. You heard the sermon said, the devil is using all kinds of tricks and gadgets. To ensnare you. And all of a sudden, the minds that were saying, Lord, how oh, it is that I used to prophesy for you. But then you remember that you prophesied for Jesus, but you kill a man. And you never ask forgiveness. You prophesied for Jesus, but you told a lie and sent somebody to jail. You prophesied for Jesus, but you broke the Sabbath. Am I making sense, church? All these things will be before you. And I know for a fact that some of us who grew up in the country, you remember when people used to travel, when they're on their deathbed, and people said they're traveling. And when they're traveling, what happens is that they start to tell you everything that happened in their lives. Am I talking the true church? Yes. And some of us used to go wet mouth. Throw a little water in their mouth. God was showing us that in the final analysis, when he comes back and people are saying, how it is that I am lost, he's going to show me why I am lost. Because every record is in your brain. He hasn't got to go far. He has the original and the duplicate. As a matter of fact, two original. One in the brain and one that the angel wrote down. Can't wrong. So no. When these people who are lost see that they can't even deny one single thing, because sometimes we deny it, you know. But deep down in our heart, you know it's true. We defend ourselves, but when the person gone and say, you know, I was telling the truth, but you won't confess it. But the Bible says, when those who are lost, when God has re- allowed them to remember everything. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So since people who are lost are going to do that, why not do it now and bow down now and confess now? Because when we do that now, there is eternal gain. Then it will be alligator tears. You know alligator tears? Virgin and friends in Jamaica were born and grow. Alligator tears is when somebody will know that they, they pretend that if they're crying, but they're not really crying. They pretend as if they're sorry, but they're not really sorry. So all the alligator tears, that are the, and every tongue going to confess, all the alligator tears walk away because it is now right in the open. Jesus says to them, Matthew 7, 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He says, Matthew 25, 24, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Who, 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 who it is that should have gone into the fire in the beginning? The Bible says, Prepared for the devil and his angels, it did not include man. It is man who, is, who, who, who was chosen to be in the fire. How can somebody look at the person who made you, who sustained you, who gave you a home, who gave you family, who gave you success in life? How can you reject somebody who died for you to choose? 
to go to a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. This is heart rending. The part. The Bible says in Revelation 20 verse 8, the number of these people, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. The people will be lost, will be innumerable. Sometimes when I have to preach a sermon like this, my heart is broken. The new Jerusalem is there. And so the devil... The devil all of a sudden, the devil all of a sudden said to the people who are on their knees confessing, Get up! Get up! And I say, We're done dead already. Get up! Only chance we have is to attack that city. We have to overcome this city because it's the only chance we have. And so the Bible tells us that, there's, that they're going to be loose there for a season. What will they be doing? They will go to their laboratories. They will call up all the big scientific minds. Plus the devil who knows some of the chemistry and the nuclear physics and things. He is going to inspire them to make some weapons of war. And then they run up on all these weapons of war. And all those big generals who are so tactically correct and one never lost a war. All these men who are lost. The devil is going to say, come on. We have to overcome this city. Is with last chance. So the Bible says, when they made their implements of war, they went upon the breadth of the earth. You notice the Bible says, from the end of the earth, from one end to the other. Then it says, the breadth of the earth. Are you counting the number of people who will be lost? From the breadth of the earth. The Bible says, and compass the camp of the saints. Now last night we saw that the city is as big as Colorado. And these people are going to compass. They're going to surround the city. You see, oh Lord of mercy. Lord of mercy. The number of people who are lost church. Compass the camp of the saints. How can they surround a city that is 375 miles long and wide? You see how many people are lost? And the Bible says, Fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. What in hell do you want? There's nothing in hell that you and I should choose. Nothing. So as I close the sermon, I can't close it on this note. Can't close it on this note. Come on, make, let us close the sermon. We can't close it on this note where people are just dead. Because there are some people in the city. Past those things referring to the devil. The devil, the Bible said he was going to bring the devil to ashes. And rever- it could pass them, please, Mumili. Pass them. The devil, the devil will be no more. Jesus had been rejected. Those who are lost are burnt up. The whole earth is on fire. Burning, 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 burning. And there was a song that talked about 96 degrees in the shade. And they had a place in Jamaica, in Montego Bay called Disco Inferno. You think they're going to dance out there? All these people are brought to ashes. And you and I, in the city, seeing our friends, our neighbors, our relatives. But we know that God had done the right thing from the beginning. And so the Bible says, we are going to tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of our feet. God is not a morbid God. God doesn't want anyone to be ashes. But you have to choose. And so tonight, we see a glimmer of hope in Job. When Job was worried about his situation, God asked Job a few questions. Job 38, 4, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars were angels sang together. 
And all the sons of God shouted for joy. What God was saying to Job is that these persons, angels and other beings that he had created, were witnesses at his creation and of his creative power. And so those of us who are in that city, after the fire goes out, the city gates will be swung open. And we are going to watch God Almighty recreate this world. Come on, church. Eden is going to be made over. Jesus is going to say, let there be. Come on, church. And the grass comes. And the foliage comes. The Bible tells us that all these plants, let's go fast, mommy. All these plants will just come because Jesus said, let there be flowers. Let there be grapes. Let there be apples. Let there be sweet sap. Come on, a church. And you, whatever, whatever. And I want you to think about this. You are there watching Jesus recreate in this world. And you are standing there and say, Jesus, can, can you make a Nisbur tree for me? <laughs> You think he won't make it for your church? Well, no, no, man, you're not with me. And you say, Lord, I would love a custard apple tree. You think he's going to tell you, no? He's going to, you're going to watch him call all the animals into existence. It is going to be a tremendous privilege to watch my God recreate this world. A great privilege. Animals of all types and categories. The sea will bring forth all kinds of fish and sea life. Even Nemo. You see, church, how can we reject so great a salvation? I used to enjoy watching my father make things until I learned how to make them too. My children enjoyed watching me make things until they are able to make them too. Think of the God who you love and the God who loves you with an everlasting love. Recreating the world in your presence. What a privilege! We don't understand how much we mean to God. The devil has bumped has bombarded us through the, through the ages and in our time, making us believe that we are nothing. We are not important to God. But your price is so great that God paid the ultimate price for it. As a matter of fact, the Bible, the Bible didn't say no. The Bible said you were bought with a cost. He said you were bought with a price. And you don't even know what the price is. Because the blood of Jesus... The value of the blood of Jesus is beyond our understanding. And to watch Jesus make over this world. And to know that the, the throne of God is going to be in this world. This world is going to be the center of the universe. And you and I are going to be citizens of a world that will last forever. We can't finish the sermon on no hell. We are not focused on hell. We're showing you what hell is going to be. But what is beyond hell? God this did not intend for anybody to be in hell. And anyone in this church tonight, I don't want you to leave here thinking that Lord God wicked he, he would have done everything to save and those who are lost. But I have to leave you with the concept that God is going to recreate this place. And you must want to be a citizen in that world. And in contrast to what I'm saying, probably comparing what I'm saying to the verse that says, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. Notice it didn't tell you that you have death. You do not have life. Because the focus of God's message is life. And in that world made new. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. God will be right by me. I will be with him. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run. And I don't want to put no say, I shall run. 
and not be weary. Come on, brother Ray, come on now. I shall run and not be weary. I shall walk and not faint. That is the world that God wants us to focus on tonight. Not on the faith of the wicked, but on those who are saved. And we can choose salvation tonight. Not tomorrow. Tonight. So he stands at your heart and says, let me in, please let me in. Don't think that you are beyond saving. Hug up Jesus. Hug up your salvation. Because salvation is the only thing which will last forever. And the way of the cross leads home. So you sat in this church tonight and you heard this message. And you know. See church. Just give me five minutes more. See there was a time when the things that really mattered. And I thought that there were the things that mattered. Is a foolishness of preaching. That helped me to understand what really mattered. The foolishness of preaching. I never saw myself standing before any congregation to preach. Never. I never envisaged it. I never desired it. But it, be, it was because of the foolishness of preaching why I became a Christian. And God is saying, you see, sometimes, sometimes we feel that we have everything. Sometimes we feel that we do not really need anything else. Self-sufficient, educated, a good job, pretty wife, handsome husband, lovely house, children, that's what I was. That's what I was. Bank manager. Anything you want, you have it. Help up here. Garden up here. Light up here. Telephone up here. If I want a spoon, the bank buy it. I had it. We could travel the world. London. Anytime. Anything we wanted. We had it. And one evening. We were going home. And there were some friends that we had. We were having some marital problems. And when you're a bank manager, you have, it's not only money business, you have to fix, you have to fix up people's marriage too. And so, there were many marriages that I had to counsel. And this particular couple were having a difficulty. They were known to Sister Jump and myself. So when, when, we, were, when we were talking about it, I was not betraying confidence because they also spoke to her. And we were going home. And we were talking about the issues that they were experiencing and comparing how our marriage was and trying to make sure that some of those things would never happen to us. And we are going home. And out of the blue, you know, I made us as a moment, you know, we have everything. We have everything. Yeah. Everything. When I say we had everything, church, we had everything. Who needs salvation? You have everything. And then I said, you know, mommy, you know, it's one thing we really don't have. Because there's a saying, there's a scripture that says, train up a child in the way he should go. And I remember my days at Sunday school. And I remember my days when my auntie took me to son to Sabbath school. And I said, mommy, you know, we have everything, but we do not have salvation. As plain as that. And we say, all right. It was about October, September, October, just like now. And we say, all right, January morning, we're going to church. January morning. That decision was taken in 1984. 
And January morning, 1985, we came here to Andrews. And by God's grace, we have not left. Amen. We have been through thick and thin. And I tell you, when you choose God, some things happen to you sometimes that are beyond your imagination. Some things have happened to us since I became a Christian, which I'm satisfied if I had not made my decision, then I would not have had these problems. But I'm glad I have them. And so you're sitting in the church this evening and you think you have everything. It's just one, one split second and all the things that make you feel so self-confident and assured, they'll leave you. And what do you have? When we had our difficulties, it's because we knew Jesus Why we are seized up there sitting and I'm standing here. Because what a, what a friend we have in Jesus. It is the alarm. It is the, that light. That light key, right? God wants you to come face to face with the reason for your existence. The reason for your existence is not only to have things and be important and be, be self-sufficient. The reason for my existence is to belong to God. And when you put Jesus first, any challenge that comes your way, it no longer is you. It is God and I. And so you are sitting in this church this evening. And you know that the things that I have been talking about are pertinent to your situation. I extend an invitation to you. Would you like to raise your hand tonight saying, Lord, I've listened to this message and I know that what I've heard is true. I know that there's a heaven to win and a hell to shun. I know that there's salvation and damnation and I'm choosing salvation tonight. Would you like to raise your hand? Our Bible instructors will give you a card. And you will fill it out. There are some options on it. I would like to be a Christian. I would like Bible study. I would like prayer. Whatever it is that you write on that card is the beginning of a new life that Jesus will lead you step by step into his kingdom. Is there anyone? Are there many? I shouldn't be pessimistic. I should be optimistic. Are there many in the church this evening who would like to raise their hands for Jesus? Lord, I understand that hell is going to be a place where I shouldn't be. But heaven is where I belong. With you, living and reigning with you forever. Are there hands for Jesus this evening? We have listened to a solemn message. Solemn message. Would you like to raise those hands for Jesus this evening? You're saying, Father, I want to be a part of your everlasting kingdom. I don't want to be no ashes that people will tread upon. 